hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Stanford Algebraic Geometry Seminar. Uh, a few announcements before starting. Uh, please mute yourself unless you have something you wish to say, uh, but if you're willing, please leave your video on so we can see each other. Uh, and for those interested, there's a parallel chat in Discord, and you can use it uh, only if you feel like it, because some people find it distracting, and others find that it, that it helps them concentrate. So, uh, but the speaker will not be watching any sort of chat. Uh, and the style of the seminar is traditionally being that people ask the speaker a lot of questions, uh, including quite elementary ones, or just asking you to repeat something. Uh, so, uh, so please do so. Uh, and you can just, the seminar is small enough that if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask it out loud. Uh, and don't worry, like we have like a, nothing counts as a stupid question. Uh, so we have a, we, we want people to ask lots of questions. Uh, don't raise your hand because otherwise no one's going to see you or use anything else on Zoom. Uh, and if you also, if you see a question in the discussion that you think should be asked, then just unmute yourself and ask it out loud. Okay, so it's a pleasure to welcome John Autumn from the University of Oslo. Uh, his title, I feel like there's like this, there's a, a joke involved, but probably he didn't intend it. It's on two, three, four folds. And uh, it's a joke when you're in elementary school here is why well, was six afraid of seven? And the answer was because seven, eight, nine. Uh, and the follow up, uh, our current one is why, uh, why was 2019 afraid of uh, 2020? It's because they got in a fight in 2021. So now it's great to introduce John who will tell us about on two, three, four. Right. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me here to speak um, and for the introduction. And um, thanks to everyone for uh, for tuning in in the middle of the summer. Um, I really do encourage uh, people asking questions. So if you if you have something that you you're wondering about, then feel free to just uh, interrupt. Um, so I'll talk about um, a sort of ongoing project with Johannes uh, Nikias. Um, uh, about stable rationality. Um, and um, I realize perhaps a few people may have heard um, parts of this uh, talk bef uh, before online. Um, so I apologize for that. But um, I decided to, to um, give a slightly different take on, on the subject, uh, focusing on slightly different uh, um, examples in this talk. So um, yeah specifically about these two, three, four folds that I'll get to in a, in a second. All right. Um, yeah, so this is uh, joint with uh, Johannes Nikias. Um, and uh, just to set the stage, I'll um, recall what it means to be a, a rational variety. Um, so X is rational if it's uh, birational to a, a predictive space. Uh, and it's stably rational if it uh, becomes um, rational by taking a product with a predictive space. Um, and more generally, we say that uh, two varieties, X and Y, are stably birational uh, to each other, um, or stably birational equivalent, if they become birational after taking you know, products uh, with uh, predictive spaces on, on both sides. So this is uh, an equivalence relation that, that will be important uh, in the talk. All right, so sort of one sentence uh, summary of, of the paper uh, is that it gives a quite general method for um, this uh, rationality problem for, for complete intersections in the toric varieties. So in general, it's a quite difficult problem to, to try to de well, determine whether a given variety is, is rational and um, and this gives sort of a, a set of um, obstructions um, that can allow you to to sort of disprove rationality. Okay, so um, yeah, everything I'll uh, say today will be in characteristic uh, characteristic zero because it, uh, many of the techniques that we use rely on uh, weak factorization and resolution of singularities. Actually, there's already, a, there's already a first question, which is for people who don't know anything about the topic, uh, is there anything that's, I mean, what's the first example of something that's stably rational that's not rational? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a little bit hard to produce. Uh, I think the first examples were by um, Beauville, uh, Sansuk, uh, Colotelen, and uh, Swinnerton Dyer in, I think, 83. Um, so uh, there's only one known example of this. I think it's a threefold, which is 
irrational, but it com becomes rational by taking a product with uh, P2. So these uh, uh, examples are known to exist, but uh, I, I think that's basically the only one um, that's explicitly known. Um, so in general, it, it is uh, a sort of different uh, notion, but it, it turns out that it's, it's sometimes easier to disprove that um, something is stably rational. Um, uh, yeah, or just as easy uh, to, to, to prove um, or to disprove stable rationality than, than rationality. Okay, um, right, so I guess the main example is for, um, for hypersurfaces in PN. Um, so our main example is, um, well, quartic fivefolds. So the, the theorem is just um, a very general quartic fivefold is stably irrational. So here, very general means that in the collection of all quartic uh, fivefolds or the, the space of quartic polynomials that uh, define uh, quartic fivefolds, uh, there are sort of um, uh, countably ma um, many closed subsets that you have to remove. And, and if you're in the complement of those, then, um, well, the corresponding point would be a, um, a stably irrational quartic fivefold. So this is a sort of typical statement that you get um, something that that's true for very general uh, quartic fivefolds, um, not just smooth. Actually, here's a actually a question about. So maybe we're saying is that you, you care about stable rationality because that means you know it's not rational. So do, did we know? A very general quartic fivefold was not ra was not even rational before. That was an open problem. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe I'll say a little bit about uh, sort of what, well, what's known about hypersurfaces in, in, in general. But before I get uh, to that, I'll, I'll just sort of briefly summarize what we what we proved. Um, so of course, one thing is about uh, quartic fivefolds. Um, but uh, we also give new proofs of sort of known results, um, like lower degree and, um, sorry, higher degree and lower dimension. So for instance, quartic fourfolds uh, is also a consequence here. Um, and also there's this uh, incredible bound by Stefan Schreider, um, which um, is the best known um, bound for Irrational hypersurfaces in in higher dimension. Well, it basically says that if if d is larger than the logarithm uh, of uh, the dimension uh, plus two, then then the hypersurface is, is irrational. So we we give sort of a, a series of um, improvements to that um, formula there. But of course, I, I do emphasize that we we use uh, Schreider's results as as input, and um, uh, but we we find some sort of way to um, improve uh, his bounds. Okay, so let me just quickly go through the what's known. <clears throat> um, so we have this uh, chart uh, where, well, we have the dimension in the um, in the x-axis here, and then the degree. Um, and basically, this is. <laughs> The summary of what uh, what's known: um, everything is red uh, in red here is is stably irrational, and what's in green is stably rational. So there uh, there were many breakthroughs um, on this problem, um, starting with maybe Clements and Griffiths. And um, sorry, does the or is orange red or is yellow? What, what's what counts as red in this? Is pink pink is red? Um, pink is red, yes. Uh, orange is different because we don't know if the cubic threefold is stably irrational. It, we know that it's irrational um, by, well, Clements and Griffiths, uh, but um, yeah, it's still an open problem whether this is uh, stably irrational. Um, but it's known that the quartic threefold is stably uh, irrational. This was uh, due to Kolotelen and Pirutka. And then the quartic fourfolds was due to uh, um, Bert uh, Tutaro. 
so our new contribution here is is sort of the next one in the line and um, as you mentioned it was is not even known if this was uh, rational um, before yeah um, and this bound by Schreider, well, that really starts to kick in in dimension four, uh, sorry, five and, and higher. I mean, in, in well, up to dimension 18, well, he covers the degree six. Um, and, and you see it, it, it just keeps getting uh, better here. So that's a very, very strong uh, result. Um, and we can sort of get some extra cases at, at the end here um, by by sort of sharpening um, what he does. Okay, um, so I, I'll get, I'll, I'll say a few words about the quartic fivefolds uh, in a bit, but uh, you know the, the main uh, class of examples will, will not be um, hypersurface and projective spaces, um, but rather complete intersections. All right, so this is the the first two, three, fourfold. Um, yeah, the theorem is a very general complete intersection of a, a quadric and a cubic in PN. That's stably rational if, well, the dimension is at, at most uh, uh, five, oh, sorry, four. Um, and um, well, these are quite interesting fun of varieties. I mean, they, they're sort of the, 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 I mean, once you move outside hypersurfaces, this is sort of the next interesting case. Um, so, so there's a sort of interesting story here related to the Loroth uh, problem, which asks whether a unirational variety um, is uh, rational or, or stably rational. Um, and this was one of the sort of first attempts to, uh, for a counter example um, to that problem. Um, right, so it starts with, uh, I guess, Fano um, in 1908, who published a, well, incorrect proof that uh, these uh, um, complete intersections were, were stably rational in the, in the threefold case. And uh, four years later, Enrique, um, Enriquez, uh, he, he proved that they are at least unirational. So uh, as it stands, you know, it would be uh, a counterexample to the, the Roth problem. Um, but of course, uh, it was not before we had the sort of intermediate Jacobian method that we really had a um, correct proof that this was irrational. And it was improved by it has to a jinkle to, to prove that it's even um, stably irrational. Um, for, for uh, again, dimension three. Um, and uh, there's also a classical result by Mora um, and uh, Conte and Mura, who proved that uh, these complete intersections are, are unirrational for also dimension four. Um, so this is uh, uh, maybe an older result, yeah. Okay, so now at least we know that uh, also in dimension four, that's the, the sort of new um, new piece of uh, information here. Now also these are stably irrational. And that's an interesting, uh, well, it's an interesting uh, result because um, uh, it's really the last case uh, of like Fano complete intersections. Um, of dimension four, um, except for the cubic fourfolds uh, case. Um, and in fact, these uh, complete intersections, they do resemble cubic fourfolds uh, in many ways. I mean, these uh, fourfolds, they have a variety of, of lines, uh, which are Calabiao, and then they have a quite close uh, connection between the Calabiao and, and uh, the complete intersection. Um, yeah, so yeah, many analogies, uh, analogies between uh, these cubic fourfolds and, and these uh, uh, complete intersections. Okay, um, I, I see some questions in the chat. Should I just um, uh, answer them right away or? Uh, I would ignore the chat, uh, although maybe oh, I, uh, 
Uh, okay, I'll leave it to yeah, you to yeah, ignore the chat, and then people can can jump in whenever. That way, people can argue with each other uh, without arguing. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So I think this is probably what. Um, yeah, I did prepare a, a proof of this uh, statement here. Um, this is sort of the maybe the most important type of two, three, fourfold, but there's one more. Um, before before I get to to those, I'll talk about um, a little bit more about uh, complete intersections. Um, right. So in general, if you have if you intersect um, our hypersurfaces in in Pn. Um, it's it's harder than for hypersurfaces to <laughs> to check whether it's um, it's it's rational or not, uh, just because well, that, well hypersurfaces are are just simpler to to compute with. So one one thing that we do is to to sort of give um, bounds for when when there's such a complete intersection is is irrational, and these are uh, well they're sort of logarithmic in the, in the sense of um, uh, Schreider. So it, 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 essentially, if the, these uh, DIs are, um, or the sum of those are, are very large, then, then, um, then uh, the complete intersection is, is stably irrational. Um, yeah, so also... So is this, about the, is this about the index of the fact? I mean, like, what's the... Is there some expectation about the sort of the index of the Fano um, because of this uh, Schreider type? It's not particular. I mean, it's not. I mean, the bounds are a little bit different than just uh, the, the the sum or the the index. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll say a few words about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, you get different inequalities. I think it's not just the sum of the DIs that matter. Um, Okay, but one quite nice result is uh, that we can say uh, that many complete intersections of quadrics are are irrational. So, for instance, it was known for I think intersections of three quadrics in P seven that those are um, stably irrational. This is due to Hassett and, and Chinkel, and we can sort of get a uniform result in in higher dimensions. Um, so it's it's basically when uh, when the number of equations is about half of the dimension, um, and yeah, so so these logarithmic bounds they they work very well in a sort of high dimension, but uh, we also settle many in in low dimension. So so for instance, here's an overview of complete intersections in dimension five. So the ones that are marked in in bold, there are sort of new cases that we can cover. So the quartic fivefold was already mentioned, but we can also, well, look at complete intersections of, well, a quadric and a, and a, a quartic in um, in P seven, and also an intersection of two cubics in P seven. So we get all these, uh, well. <laughs> Um, new results for completer sections um, of hypersurfaces. All right, um, I guess one, okay, um, one sort of very different set of examples is, is when we look at products of projected spaces. Um, so the, the analysis here is a little bit different because the Picard number is, is larger. So um, I guess the just the um, but rational geometry here becomes more more complicated. Um, so here, there were quite a few results about, say, stable or maybe uh, birational rigidity of such uh, hypersurfaces, but basically, essentially no results for for stable rationality. What what does birational rigidity mean? Well, it it means that um, well, it's a, it's a certain um, property of the of X that it basically says that any birational self map extends to an ice or an an, an automorphism of X. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's a statement that X has very very few birational automorphisms in in contrast to uh, you know projective space which is which has a huge automorphism group. 
so it's a criterion for non-rational. It's a way to show things are not rational, even when they look like they might be rational. By other exactly. Yeah, th this is the abstraction by Iskowski and Manin, um, who proved that the quartic threefold was uh, irrational. And in, in fact, when when the quartic threefold is smooth, then this birational automorphism group is uh, is just uh, finite. Yeah. So this is uh, yet another um, uh, obstruction. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, let me. I mean, there, there are a few <laughs> um, results, but let me focus on maybe what's the maybe the most interesting case, which is. Um, hypersurface in P1 cross Pn. So you should think of these as hypersurfaces which are sort of fibered over P1. So you know they're Bono vibrations or uh, yeah, Mori fiber spaces or something like that. So um, yeah, again you, you just ask you know which degrees or by degrees that correspond to uh, stably rational hypersurfaces. And uh, and the answer here is at least known for lower dimension, um, the dimension at being at most four. Um, so one one way you could be rational if this a the, um, if it, if this a is one. So if you have a one e hypersurface, then well, if a is one, then it, it's given by a linear equation in uh, in the, in the coordinates on p one. So if you look in the projection to PN, you see that it's um, uh, it's a birational map. So X is is obviously rational. Um, but you can also look when B is two or or at most two, then X is a, a quadric bundle over over P one, and then it's also rational by by sense theorem. Uh, so these are sort of, uh, yeah, um, some obvious cases that that are rational, and, and the theorem is that those are the only cases. So um, I guess the the first open case is when when a is uh, well two and b is three. So that's another two three fourfold um, in p one cross uh, p four. And uh, essentially, if you prove that is stably rational, then by some sort of uh, separate argument, then you can deduce the, the theorem above. Um, but uh, yeah, two, three uh, divisors in P1 cross P4, th those are, are quite interesting uh, fun of rights as well. Um, so um, here at the... the <laughs> The, the fourfold is definitely not uh, super rigid, or sorry, uh, it's not birationally rigid because it has this sort of involution coming from the, the double cover that you get from um, the projection to, to P4. Um, and if you look at the uh, projection to P1, well, it's, you see that it's a vibration uh, into um, cubic threefolds. So I think this is the first known example of something like a, um, a, a Fano, uh, sorry, a cubic threefold vibration, um, which is known to be uh, stably rational. I mean, th there are not so many structures that you can use here. I mean, it's not it's in an obvious way birational to a quadric bundle or anything like that. So, um, and and cubic threefolds are are complicated over. Uh, non-algebraically closed field. So uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's why this was an open um, case as well. All right, so by, by the end of the talk, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, or hopefully have explained uh, how to prove this. So we'll, so we'll even know why this is like, we'll not just know that you did it, but we'll even understand why it's true ourselves. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'll probably start with the proofs uh, now, um, yeah, I think I'll probably focus on this case, uh, and then yeah, we'll see. All right, okay. So let me just say sort of a few words about the, sort of the general um, ingredients in the proofs here. Um, uh, so this is this really applies to all of the the arguments. I mean, the main input here is the 
um, specialization of birational types. Uh, this was due to uh, Nikes and Schinder for um, stable rationality, um, and then improved by Konsevich and Schinkel for rationality. So it basically says that uh, by ra or being rational stabilizes in, uh, in smooth and proper families. I'll, I'll make this precise in a bit, but this is maybe the most important um, outside in ingredient. Uh, the second ingredient is uh, to use, uh, well, tropical geometry and like toric degenerations to construct um, interesting degenerations of, uh, of these complete intersections. So that allows you to sort of um, translate, you know, rationality problems into, you know, questions about like polytopes or, you know, fans or um, rather combinatorial questions. So, um, yeah, and then those tend to be much easier. Um, and finally, we we do need some sort of irrational input here. So um, I guess uh, one thing we need is to um, some we we need to degenerate to something that that we know is stably irrational. So we need need um, these results by uh, by Schreider and also the Art and Mumford example um, was important. Okay. Um, but I'll try to highlight in, in the proof where, where each step um, is used. Let me just start uh, talking about these uh, specialization uh, theorems for birational types and then move on to the, the main, um, main theorems. All right, um, so I'll present a slightly simplified version of, of uh, the results by uh, Nikias and Schindler. Um, that, that's sort of just enough uh, for for what we need for the proofs. So I'll let SB, F, denote the set of stable birational equivalence classes. Um, so this is just a set um, where I only consider integral um, F varieties. And for a variety X, I'll let, um, well, the bracket SB um, denote the equivalence class. Um, and here, here and F, we, F's your field. F is like F is like the complex numbers in this. This is okay. F is any field of characteristic zero. Um, yeah. So far, I mean, uh, moving between fields will be important uh, later. So I, I just want to do it uh, completely general first. All right. So so far, we've defined this for for integral uh, schemes, and. Um, but uh, you can sort of extend this definition just by sort of summing the um, the classes of the irreducible components, and we we work in uh, in this uh, free group on on stable rational types. So it's important that we sort of, I mean, even for non-reduced schemes, we I mean, we just completely throw away the the non-reduced structure. And just I mean, the class of X is the same as the class of the reduction. So it's just the sort of components that, that matter. All right, so this is a, a ring uh, also, just by, because you can multiply classes using the, the fiber product. So this is, the, this is a pretty natural um, ring to, to compute in if you want to work with uh, birational um, or rationality problems. All right, so <laughs> I guess there's one sort of fundamental theorem here due to Larson and Luntz from the early 2000s. Um, so it's, it's basically like this uh, um, isomorphism here. So here K um, denotes the growth in the group of, or the growth in the ring of varieties. Um, and L denotes the class of, the, of A1 or the affine line. And uh, well, this is this is a ring that's formed by sort of taking all the um, isomorphism classes of varieties and modding out by the by some relations. And um, there's a sort of natural map that uh, sends x to its uh, stable variational type. And it's a sort of an amazing fact that this uh, becomes an isomorphism after modding out by this uh, class of the affine line. 
so this is of course a sort of fundamental uh, theorem um, that that will implicitly be using and uh, it's also one of the uh, places that we we really use uh, characteristic zero on this this proof uh, only I mean it really uses uh, weak factorization okay um, right all right so let me just uh, set up some notation so I'll work over the field of uh, Poussieur series uh, so this is the sort of union of all the these uh, uh, Laurent uh, series uh, rings um, and we um, we consider also the valuation ring of that um, with a uh, well if we give this field uh, the t-adic uh, valuation um, right so this is uh, fairly standard in in um, uh, logarithmic geometry um, and we say that an R scheme so R is this valuation ring um, is strictly semi-stable if it ad admits some sort of more or if it locally looks like um, just the intersection of, of uh, some hyperplanes. Um, so uh, maybe <laughs> it's easier to just see in a picture. So we say that a scheme um, X is semi-stable if um, basically, uh, yeah, <laughs> if it locally looks like, uh, you know, the intersection of some hyperplanes like this. So I, I, I think this is the right picture to have in mind. You have some sort of generic fiber here over, over the spectrum of the field of uh, Poussieur series. And then you have this special fiber um, corresponding to the close point. And here we say that this degenerates into the, this uh, union here. And uh, yeah, we really require this to be um, rather nice. Uh, so the components here are are smooth and uh, yeah, they intersect uh, transversely. Okay, um, and with that, so if we take some sort of yeah, if we take a proper semi-stable model over over this uh, valuation ring with the uh, special fiber uh, given like this, then Nikias and Schindler prove that um, well, there's a unique ring homomorphism from um, the, the ring of the stable birational types over the generic fiber uh, to the same ring over um, the special fiber. And it's given by an explicit uh, formula that, well, if you take such a semi-stable model, then it's given by some alternating sum of uh, strata here. So for each subset J of, um, of I, I is the set of all the components, you look at all the possible intersections um, of these uh, divisors and uh, you sum their, their classes in, inside the, um, and the ring of um, stable birational types. Okay, so this is uh, a very important uh, formula uh, that will, yeah, be very important in, the, in, the, in this talk. Should we see this as like some sort of, by way of explicit semi-stable reduction, you kind of just by hand, you resolve the singularities and you add and subtract? Is that, the, is that why it's true either literally or morally? Um, Singularity. Yeah, I guess you can say that. Uh, I mean, of course, it, it doesn't depend on the the, um, the the model that you choose. Uh, but that's because it's their invariance, right? I mean, you can pick your yeah. But oh, I'm not. I'm not. I, I, I'm not minimizing the result. This is like a very really useful result. But I'm trying to understand why I should, after the fact, believe it. Uh, or like think it's right. I mean, I, I think there are sort of similar looking formulas in, um, you know, for instance, for like uh, mixed Hodge structures and. Uh, um, well, um, I guess it, it also comes from motivic integration where, where you can really interpret this as some sort of volume. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I think there were sort of reasons to expect that such a formula should be, be true from in advance. 
Um, but it, I, I don't think I'll say so much more about it, but uh, well, <laughs> um, what's important is that uh, it's a it's, um, ring homomorphism from the generic fiber to the special fiber, and it's given by this alternating sum. Okay, so let me instead just list some sort of um, consequences of that formula. Um, so first of all, it sends the class of a point to the class of a point. Um, and uh, that is, I mean, maybe that's the most important uh, conclusion here because you, you get a, an obstruction to a stable rationality of, of the generic fiber. So if you if you find some sort of degeneration of of uh, of your hypersurface and co or complete intersection, and you compute this uh, this alternating sum, or at least show that it's not equal to the class of a point, then the generic fiber uh, is stably irrational. Um, so it's an interesting uh, idea because uh, the generic fiber is probably like you know, a smooth. It's a quite a uh, nice variety, but of course you're degenerating into something which may have many components and somehow this union should be, a, you know, remember whether or not the, the generic fiber is, is rational or not. Okay, so this is uh, something that's uh, very important in the argument, so um, yeah, <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, I guess there's one, um, I mean, a priori this, this was maybe the most um, uh, yeah, <laughs> groundbreaking consequence here. Um, this was uh, if you just take a, a smooth family over mm. over R. Um, so if if X is smooth and proper, then the, the formula just specializes to the the special fiber itself. Uh, so in other words, well, um, if the, if if you know that the generic fiber is rational, then also the the special um, fiber has to be rational. So in other words, um, stable rationality, it specializes in smooth and proper families. Um, Actually, would you mind saying that again? So what, how did that follow from, uh, I have to maybe flip back. Uh, how did the smooth and properness, maybe I just missed Well, I mean, yeah, so if, uh, okay. I mean, if you, so th this is an intersection of all the components of the strata, right? Okay. So if, if you have something that's smooth, it's ir irreducible so that, you know, that there's only one stratum, that, namely the, the whole fiber itself. It really is. Uh, that's great. That's fantastic. That's, that's, yeah, it's a, that's kind of a, yeah. wait, suddenly this becomes very, okay, that's much more alarming. Like I was thinking of a degeneration where you have lots of pieces and I'm not so surprised that, that there could be, but that's, this is, it's actually yeah, yeah. It's extremely surprising now that you just have a smooth, there, there are no strata. <laughs> that, that's that's right. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. So this was uh, a, you know an open problem for a long time whether you know special uh, um, stable rationality is um, specializing in or was a closed condition in, in smooth families. And um, uh, yeah, this was maybe the, the highlight uh, or the, the most important corollary. And this was improved by Konsevich and Chinkul um, a week after the paper, uh, 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 improving it from stable rationality to, to um, rationality. Yeah. Okay. But um, actually, I'll, I mean, in this talk, it, it will be more important what happens if you do have sort of many strata in, uh, in the degenerations. Um, let me just give sort of a very basic example how to use this uh, um, to, to prove your rationality. So, I mean, we can maybe reprove a result by Claire Voisin, um, namely that a very general uh, double uh, quartic threefold is irrational. So, of course, a very general quartic um, threefold is, uh, um, is smooth. Um, so it's a double cover of P3 branched along a quartic uh, surface. But uh, what you can do, you can degenerate it into some a threefold which is singular. And uh, the degeneration that's uh, 
most natural to use is the, the Art and Mumford example. So there is a singular um, double cortic threefold um, where you have uh, torsion in the H3, or the, the, the Brouwer group of the, um, of the threefold is, is non-trivial, so this is not stably rational. Um, and then, well, of course, you have to be a little bit careful because when you degenerate just sort of naively, um, that's not really a semi-stable uh, model, but you know, resolving the, the singularities here, they, they only sort of add uh, rational variety. So um, the, the alternating sum formula that we had, uh, it, it still gives you the right uh, conclusion. Okay, so uh, I mean, that's a very easy, uh, I mean, of course, uh, this is uh, a very um, important result by Poisson, but uh, it's still, I mean, the, the technique that we used um, really used a very uh, simple degeneration just by to, to an irreducible um, special fiber. Um, Okay, so I, I guess one of the sort of key insights in this talk is that we do get much better results by using degenerations with many, many components. And the, the, the whole point is that you can look in, in the terms in this alternating formula. And the, the idea is that we look at um, degenerations where the irrational strata of sort of low dimension may be shown to not cancel out in this, in this uh, sum. So if we find a degeneration where it's sort of with many th pieces that intersect and maybe there's one sort of small strata that, that you know is irrational, then you can sometimes um, use this formula to conclude that the generic fiber is, is uh, so, so presumably you have to. So presumably you have to, I mean, you really have to know your big components you have to have extremely good control over all the, and normally that this feels like a hopeless thing because you don't have complete control over the big components. Uh, exactly, yes. Yeah, so that's the, so of course this is the general idea, but now, as, as you say, now you have to really produce um, suitable degenerations that where you can make this actually work. All right, so to do that, we use, uh, um, well, we use the theory of uh, tropical degenerations. So I'll, I'll explain uh, what that, uh, that is, what those are. Um, so basically this is going to give you some sort of recipe to write down explicit degenerations of, of basically any toric variety. So if you take a, a toric variety of Y that's given by some, some polytope, well, this is the polytope of uh, P3. So it's a three-dimensional simplex, um, but it's a scaled simplex. So uh, I emphasize that this is uh, because, uh, you know, a projective toric variety uh, comes with a polarization if, if, you, uh, if you're handing it um, a polytope. So this polytope here, it gives you a, a toric variety plus the polarization given by four times the hyperplane uh, divisor. So th this picture here really, I mean, you should think of this as, you know, a quartic surface. This is P3 with O4. All right. Um, so, so of course that, that's, um, that's what we're starting with. That's a, you know, a hypersurface in PN. Um, so if, if you now take a subdivision of the polytope, well, um, okay, so let me explain. So I take a polytope delta down here, and well, I assume that it's a lattice polytope, so all of the, these points here are just uh, um, yeah, lattice points. And for each lattice point in delta, I choose some random um, you know, value, like I, I choose a function on the, um, the lattice points on, uh, of delta. And from that function, I can take the lower uh, convex hull like this. Uh, and that will give you some sort of combinatorial object, um, which will have some faces that will project down to a subdivision of, uh, of delta. 
So it's a it's a special class of subdivisions of polytopes that arise from from functions on the on the lattice points. Um, so a priori, it's not um, obvious that well, if you just take a <laughs> random uh, function like that, that that you actually get a, a lattice subdivision that these uh, polytopes here are, are lattice um, polytopes. But um, we only focus on the the subdivisions that we get where 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 this actually happens. So P will be a um, subdivision where all of the polytopes um, are lattice points, uh, lattice polytopes. Okay, so what's interesting for us is that if you have a subdivision of uh, this polytope, it induces a degeneration of the toric variety into a union of, uh, of sort of smaller toric varieties. So we have one toric variety for each polytope inside this uh, subdivision. So that's the special fiber of the degeneration. And because everything is sort of defined combinatorially here, we know how to think about how these pieces intersect. I mean, they, they should intersect according to, uh, you know, the, 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 the faces. So if you have uh, two polytopes that intersect along a face, the, well, then that phase also gives you a toric variety. And uh, yeah, <laughs> the intersections of the two components are, well, are just given by, by the toric variety corresponding to the smaller polytope. Okay, so there's some sort of, it's a, it's a quite neat uh, um, way of translating sort of combinatorics of, uh, well, subdivisions of polytopes into degenerations of, of toric varieties. So maybe it's easier if I just show you two examples where, <laughs> where, uh, where this happens. If I start with the P1 cross P1, uh, the polytope is given by the unit square, and the polarization is given by well, O of one and, and O of one. So if I subdivide by adding the diagonal here, then what you'll end up with is like two um, simplices, like um, corresponding to P2. Um, and each piece has the polarization O of one. So geometrically, this is just the usual degeneration of a quadric surface into a union of two planes that intersect along a line. And then the line is, of course, this P1 corresponding to the, the diagonal. here. OK, so maybe a more sophisticated example. So if, if we take the cortex surface that we had uh, from before, we can add uh, maybe a face, uh, or we can add a polytope like this. Or maybe maybe just like slice it using the hyperplane x0 plus x1 equals 2. So that gives you two polytopes uh, corresponding to two uh, toric threefolds that intersect along, um, sorry, uh, a toric surface corresponding exactly to this uh, p1 cross p1, this, uh, this square that we had here. Right. Okay, um, so so this is sort of the most convenient way of writing down degenerations uh, in our paper. So maybe we can sort of phrase this uh, this obstruction that we had earlier in terms of just sort of polytopes. Uh, so if you have a Laurent polynomial um, with Newton polytope given by this uh, this delta, then you can form sort of smaller polynomials by taking just the monomials that appear in, in phases of, of the subdivision, and you get new, um, well, hyperservices that you can uh, write down. And uh, we assume that this F is sort of general in the sense that these uh, hyperservices here are, are smooth for, for every phase. Okay, so, so F is the hypersurface that we want to show is irrational, and we we have this subdivision of the polytope, and and basically we're looking for a sort of a combinatorial way to uh, to say that you know a very general uh, F should should be very uh, or should be stably irrational. All right, so this is the um, obstruction. So if you look at the alternating sum of, of all of the these hypersurfaces corresponding to 
to faces, if this alternating sum is, is different from uh, the class of a point, well, up to a sign, then, well, f is, uh, is stably irrational. Okay, so, you know, it's basically a, con um, a consequence of the theorem of Nikias and Schindler. But there, there is a sort of subtle point here that these degenerations, they don't really give you semi-stable um, degenerations. I mean, they're, they're sort of stuff that you have to, to blow up before you, you, um, uh, you get something that's semi-stable. But um, luckily, the, the pieces that you have to blow up, they're, they're quite nice. Uh, they only introduce sort of, um, well, <laughs> rational varieties uh, in, in in this uh, uh, ring of stable rational types. So the conclusion can really be, be checked uh, without doing any blow ups or something. It's just a condition on the uh, polytopes. All right, um, let me just sort of very quickly explain to you how, how this works for the quartic um, fivefold. Um, <laughs> once you've set this up, it's really just sort of one slide, which is quite nice. Um, so we start with the Newton polytope given by the, the um, four times the unit simplex. So this is the Newton polytope of a quartic fivefold. Um, and well, it looks like this. <laughs> uh, well, what you see in the picture is the subdivision of that simplex. Um, so we, we subdivide uh, by throwing in Again, this uh, this plane, uh, well, the sum of the coordinates equal to two, and then we add some um, some extra faces here, uh, or the sum of the, these coordinates here equal to one and, and three. So we have this subdivision here of the, the polytope into into four smaller polytopes, um, and the the red polytope is is the most interesting bit. Because that, that corresponds to something that we do know is irrational. So this is a 2-2 two, two divisor in P2 uh, cross P3. I mean, you can just sort of compute. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, a, it, it's clearly a, like a product polytope that, that we have. So because it's uh, degree 4, then well, we, we get 2 and 2. Yeah. Um, and and the, of course, the, the main point is that we do know that these are irrational. Uh, they're, this was uh, due to Hassett, Pirut, Um But uh, okay, so the, also the, the way that we've set this up is that um, if we look at the, the other polytopes here, well, oh, I mean, this is special because uh, um, if you look at these other polytopes, they all have lattice width one. Um, so the width of the, the polytope, it, it's just one. <laughs> what does that really mean? Well, it means that it, um, the, the polytope has to correspond to a, a polynomial which is linear in one of the variables. And if you have an, an equation which is linear in one of the variables, then it's clearly rational. So <laughs> it's sort of a remarkable thing that if you, if you take this irrational thing uh, in here and just subdivide the remaining thing, uh, so that everything is is sort of small in the sense that, in the sense that the the width is is one. Then everything else has to be rational. Uh, so these other components um, are are um, are all rational. Uh, and if if you just uh, look at this alternating sum, then basically what 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 you have is one sort of irrational polytope and the, the other ones are, are, are rational. So the, the whole thing that couldn't possibly be the class of a point in the, in the, the ring of stable rational types. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's it. That's how you prove that a uh, quartic fivefold is stably rational. You, you, you find the right subdivision. Um, so, so I was, that was, okay, that was devious. What's, what's, uh, so you really need, you can't uh, break the Hasselbrinka trinkle. You, you have to, you really have to rely on their irrationality. You have cheap rationality 
and you have to, uh, I wasn't sure what to expect was going to happen, but uh, you actually really do have just have some small thing. Everything else is obviously rational. And, uh, okay, and there's no way, I was, okay. So it's not that you break it into pieces, everything is rational. And by the combinatorics of adding and subtracting, you get, you don't get plus or minus one. Instead it's, you, you okay, so, and there's no way, okay. But then do you, do you get, um, uh, do you also get as a result some, every time, you're working the growth rate when you're inverting L, uh, you might have a cohomological obstruction to rationality that you are, uh, you might hope, in some sense, this is a cohomological obstruction. You could reinterpret this as a cohomological, but you might have some more classically, some something that has another name in terms of cohomological obstruction of rationality that you prove by this alternating sum. But I guess that can't be true because otherwise someone would have proved it, uh, proved the stable irrationality earlier. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I think maybe one key difference between this argument and sort of other arguments is that, you know, we're looking at five folds here, but the irrationality is deduced by a fourfold. I mean, there's a priori no reason why you should have sort of these two irrationality problems being related in any sense. Um, I mean, yeah, I think for me, that's the more sort of remarkable thing that, that uh, that you can get results in higher dimension by by, by smaller, uh, smaller looking at smaller pieces. Yeah. And so you're not generalizing, like try to like you're not generalizing. You're using irrationality results. You're not actually generalizing the method. So it really. No, that's right. Right. Okay. That's right. I mean the the, the yeah exactly. So the, yeah, there's always some sort of irrationality input, but. Uh, it's a more efficient way to sort of extract um, new results for, from all the ones, I, I guess, uh, so far, yeah. All right, let me show you one more example where, uh, where I mean, okay, so here you can, I can show, sort of just show you how to subdivide, but for, the, for these other um, results, that, I mean, you do, you do get sort of much more complicated subdivisions. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, that's also interesting. So I mentioned this uh, result um, about uh, divisors in P1 cross Pn, and we had a sort of full classification of bi degrees corresponding to rational divisors. Um, and well, okay. So the first is um, well. Again, you can take the polytope of Pm cross Pn. And uh, you can uh, you can subdivide it, um, and, and basically you can show that if a b is stably rational, then well you can increase the the, the by degree um, by one or or even the dimension by one. Um, so basically, you should think of it as sort of I mean you start with these things on the right hand side, and you can you can write down some sort of degeneration from a subdivision, and then if you knew that this thing on the left hand side were was stably irrational then then uh, the same would be true for the uh, so stable right. stable irrationality is stable yeah, that's right yeah exactly okay so but anyway that that means that um it's basically enough to to prove this result for for two three like because you can just increase um the the by degrees um and uh, let me explain this uh, part of the proof. Um, so again, we, we use this hasa purika uh cortic as an input. So I mentioned that these were like two, two, two divisors in, in P2 cross P3. But I mean, what they do is it's a little bit more than, than just the generic 2-2 two, two divisor. They really prove that a very specific equation um, does not ab admit uh, uh, the decomposition of the diagonal. So basically, <laughs> they show that anything that specializes to, to this particular 2 2 um, divisor, it, it, well, that, that's uh, not uh, stably rational uh, either because, well, this uh, property of uh, decomposition of the diagonal, it, it specializes. Um, so um, yeah, it's not just sort of the generic 2-2 divisor, it's, it's really 
a rather specific um, equation that they work with. Um, but that's good for us because this has a much smaller um, Newton polytope than the generic 2-2 uh, device here. Um, so if we try to do the same game that we, we take the Newton polytope of that and we subdivide something so that that piece appears, then, then we should be in, in good shape. But the, okay. so, so that's a, that's just a stronger state. So is it true that the um, uh, this uh, this lack of uh, decomposition of the diagonal uh, uh, does that also is there like a Schindler uh, is there an okay Schindler improvement that would I mean are your higher dimensional things also things that don't admit a decomposition of the diagonal or the argument does not respect a priori the argument doesn't respect that at all. So certainly people have looked at what happens if you degenerate uh, varieties into unions like this and what happens uh, uh, with the decomposition of the diagonal. I think uh, um, it was uh, done in a paper with uh, Bert and uh, also Stefan uh, has looked into this. Um, uh, so certainly we know quite a lot about how the decomposition of the diagonal uh, behaves in, in families like this. Um, yeah, so, yeah, again, the, the sort of main idea here is really writing down these like suitable, suitable degenerations. Okay, so let me, um, so we, we take this quartic given by Hasapiruk-Gonchinkel. So this is the Newton polytope. And you see that it's, it's, it's much smaller than the Newton polytope of the, um, of the, the 2 2 divisor in, in P2 cross P3. No, it has only uh, um, six vertices. Okay, but uh, it's interesting to compare this with the uh, Newton polytope of a general uh, two, three, uh, fourfold. Uh, so that's just given by the, the product. And the first obs observation is that this actually embeds into here, <laughs> just because, uh, well, you see that on the top line, all the coordinates are less than two. And then if you sum the the, the other coordinates you get less than three. So, so this product polytope contains this uh, irrational polytope uh, inside it. Okay, so concretely you can just write down some two, three polynomial that uh, dehomogenizes uh, de to the hasid puruj gachinko quartic. Okay, so now we're looking at uh, subdivision. Um, so what we can do is to to take the sub um, the polytope corresponding to p two no p one cross p four with this polarization, and well, basically we want a function that's that's zero on the the polytope that we know is irrational, and then it can do basically whatever um, after. So we, if if we just use this the min function, then that's a that gives you a perfectly a perfectly nice subdivision of, of um, the polytope, and because uh, p is the only uh, polytope where this function takes the value zero, that that p has to be um, a cell in inside the, um, the subdivision. So let me write down the number of cells in the in the subdivision. So. So basically what we have here is um, a subdivision of this uh, product polytope. And then there's this one uh, irrational polytope. And then you have 25 other polytopes um, of, of maximal dimension. So what we really get here is the degeneration of P1 cross P4 into a union of 26 toric varieties. So of course you you take p1 cross p4 and you you have this polarization two three and you you just follow what happens to the hypersurface in, in to this union of twenty six hypersurface um, of toric varieties. Okay, so that's the degeneration. Um, so to conclude, we really need to show that sort of you have this irrational guy and then everything else is rational. And uh, luckily, you can just sort of program this and uh, you can see that. Uh, uh, any phase in the subdivision either has lattice width one, so this is similar to what we had before, 
or it corresponds to a, a quadric bundle over, over P1. So then again, it's uh, rational or it's a conic bundle over A3 with a section and, and that those are also rational. So uh, yeah, you, you sort of just, you, you subdivide and you just check the sort of <laughs> uh, the pieces. I mean, it's fairly easy to check whether something has lattice with one and, and for these things you just uh, do, I mean, it's also easy. Um, but the conclusion is that uh, the, the volume is just um, given by this Hasebuka Chinko thing plus some rational um, classes here. And um, yeah, then you get uh, the, again the same conclusion then. I mean, this class is not equal to the class of a point. So a general two, three divisor is, is not stably rational, or it is stably rational. Okay. Um, right. So I think I, I should probably end the talk now. Um, I mean, let me just add the a word about sort of the general stra strategy in the in the paper. I mean, it's it's usually like that. We construct suitable degenerations either using like explicit equations or or these polytopes, um, and you look for uh, sort of irrational lower um, dimensional strata. And you use those to prove that uh, this alternating sum is, the, is not equal to the class of a point. So it's a fairly flexible uh, technique, I think. So probably many other applications to be found. All right, so uh, I think I'll stop here. <laughs>